I want to um, do a little something different than what I normally do. Now, others do this, but I don't. Uh, but I want to take a little liberty and play a little game. It's called God is. And what is God to you? What is when I say God is, what does it remind you of? And God is what he is because. And um, right now, let me give you an example. I uh, was listening to the um, remarks that as pastor came in and he was he was um, leading the family in and he was reading from Psalm 90 and Psalm 91. And sometimes, you know, you hear those Psalms all the time, but there are times when you hear the word and just grabs you a different way. And he and, and grabbed me a different way yesterday. And I, as I listened, I, uh, you know, I heard him read beginning of Psalm 90 and verse 2. And as I heard him read, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Now, what does that mean to you? God is what? Everything. God is creator. That's the first thing that came to my mind. God is creator. And because he is. I can know. I can know that he's God. Somebody made the heavens and the earth. All right. All right. What is God to you? Somebody tell me God is what? And then I'm going to ask somebody over here. God is because of what you say. How about that? Can we do that? Okay. God is over here. God. Okay. Well, we, we, he is creator. And we just talked about creator. Why is God creator? What does it mean? He made everything. God is everything. What does that mean that God is everything? He owns everything. Okay. God is. God is. Let me start here in the middle. God is grace. Somebody said grace. Why is God grace? He's merciful. What else? He saved us. And it took grace to save us. Is that new? <laughs> Call me. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> okay. Call me. Um, okay. God is, Brother Bill? Holy. Holy. What does that mean? God is holy. Somebody over here. Okay. Without sin. What does it mean to you, Bill? He's sinless. He's eternal. He's almighty. He's sovereign. Huh? All of those things. Perhaps the greatest attribute that I think of when I think of God, I think of his holiness. Yeah. And what that means to me, he doesn't tolerate sin. No sin. I mean, stuff that we think, no big deal. No, he doesn't tolerate it. Matter of fact, we, we remember Moses and and Joshua when they even came into his presence. He told him, take those shoes off. You're on holy ground. That's what he said. Amen. So when we think about sin. And what it cost. We can see that it wasn't cheap to buy our salvation. It wasn't cheap. Pastor, thank you for having my back. I know you have my back. But this morning, I want to talk to you about another subject. 
But there's some God is in there. And I want to talk to you about how do you know if you really know God? So I think that goes back to your. We're going to talk about some things I was talking to. Um, um, to my brother, um, Dwight, that's what I'm trying to think of, Dwight. And he was telling me about a, a friend, a person that he works with on his job. And uh, so I, I, I want to want you to go with me to First John. Chapter two. Now, I've never preached from this book. And I know pastor has many times and some things I'm going to say that I've heard him say. But. This is where I felt the Lord was leading me. And when I got into it, I felt I was in deep water. <laughs> because I went to look for one thing and I was going to go there. And, and the more I got, I said, got to go back and look at the other. And boy, I was swimming for days. Uh, but, but I want to talk about one of the central things about this book is the word fellowship. The idea of fellowship. And uh, if you go with me, uh, I, my message that I want to bring to you is in chapter two. But I feel it's important that we just look at some of the things in chapter one. First John chapter one. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. Which we have looked upon. And our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifest and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with who else his son. with his son Jesus Christ Hallelujah. and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is what? No, you must be wrong. There's got to be some darkness. No darkness. At all. <laughs> no darkness. If we say we have fellowship yeah. with him yeah. and walk in darkness. Amen. Oh, no, no, I can't read that. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> we lie <laughs> and do not the truth. Amen. But if we walk in the light yes, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. All sin. No, just some of the sin. All oh, no, you got to be kidding. Did I read that right? Yeah. All sin. Amen. That's a great thing. Yes, all sin. All sin. Yes, all sin. Yes, what a great God. Yes, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, yes, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins yes, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, okay. If we say that we have not sinned, uh. oh my, <laughs> we make him a liar uh -oh. and his word is not in us. Amen. Wow, Amen. that's some real trouble, brother. <laughs> How can you call God a liar? Amen. Oh, my. 
Okay. Now, where I want to go with this is on the other side, chapter two. And because before I get to chapter two, let me just cover some of the things we just talked about in chapter one. The word uh, fellowship is, is from the Greek word. We've he heard it before, koinonia. Uh, the idea is that of intercourse or fellowship or intimacy or having something in common. Okay. And we're here. We say we're here fellowshipping. Then we have something in common. What is that? Jesus. The Lord Jesus. We have in common. Yes. Heard Pastor talk about that yesterday. The Japan, the Korean woman. Amen. Uh, and, and surely we've all had those experiences. Yes. Yes, I've talked to people on the phone and I'll say something like Pastor said to me this morning. Um, she asked me how I'm doing. I say, well, the Lord is good. He, he's blessing me. Yes. And, uh, and and, you know, that'll get the conversation started. Now, we're talking about the Lord, and she's calling in about our taxes. How does that work? <laughs> but we can have great fellowship, okay, before we get to the... You know. <laughs> but, but even then, we can still have great fellowship, okay? So, so we, we have something in common. And in uh, 1 John chapter 3, going back to, I mean, chapter 1, verse 3, he says, That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you, that ye also, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That's the fellowship. One of the things that I learned in studying this book, and, and, and I've heard it perhaps many times, but like some things, that never, the dots never connected, is where he says, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, which we have seen, which our eyes have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. You notice that he's talking about physical things. Hands, his eyes. Um, ears, things we've heard. And when I went back, I was reading a book by Arthur B. Walton. Uh, it's called John's Tapestry of Truth. And he said John faced a problem. And the problem was that many of the issues addressed in First John were result of heretical teaching, which was a blend of Greek thought and oriental mysticism. It was making inroads into the church by the end of the first century and historically identified in the first century as Gnosticism. Gnosticism from the Greek word for knowledge taught that knowledge, not faith, knowledge, not faith. Let's see, I got to keep my eyes on my work. Knowledge, not faith was the means of salvation. Knowledge, not faith, is what it was taught. And that this knowledge was available only to those initiated into the system. It taught that the body or matter was essentially evil and independent of the spirit, which was essentially good. So the body was evil, but the spirit was good according to them. So what did that cause? Hence, the body could sin without contamination uh, or without contaminating the spirit. OK, this led to licentiousness. Now, that's a five dollar word. I didn't know what it was either. I had to go look it up. <laughs> it means sexually unrestrained. Lascivious. Now y'all can go look that one up. <laughs> Libertine. Lewd. It meant unrestrained by law or general morality. 
lawless, immoral. This also led to denial that God created the world because he could not create evil. Nor could there be a true incarnation for deity could not unite with a sinful body. So you see, they, they were creating a problem for themselves that the body was sinful. And so therefore, the body wasn't good as I understood it. And therefore, Christ couldn't have come in a body. OK, that's what John was facing. So now you go back and read it and you see why he emphasized the things that he said, that which we have heard. Which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested. And we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. Now, when you understand that, you can go back and understand why John wrote what he wrote Amen. a lot better. Um, when I get to chapter and there's so much more, maybe maybe we have a chance to uh, to get there. <laughs> Um, I want to go to chapter two, because this is where I want to uh, share with you about what Christ was doing. Amen. He says, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have a an advocate with the father. And that advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So God is an advocate. Jesus is an advocate. OK, God, the son is our advocate. Matter of fact, he said he would send a helper. The helper would be our advocate. OK, or an advocate is one who called alongside to help or to console. So we have an advocate. In Christ, he's the advocate for believers uh, with the Father, and we also have an advocate in the Holy Spirit. And he is the perpetuation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Christ satisfied the righteous and just demands of a holy God, Bill. Holy God. When he, as we just remembered in our communion, what he did on the cross for us. Now, in uh, verse three, and this is where I want to want to start. Um, how do you know you really know God? How do you know you really know God? And take a look at verse three. He says, and, and you know what? When, you, when you're sick, you go to the doctor. You go to the doctor, and they take out some instruments, and they want to do some measurements. And they want to measure your vital signs. Okay? They want to see what condition you're in. If you're sitting in that chair and still alive. So they want to see your vital signs and vital signs are things like temperature and pulse, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate. And there's other things that they measure. Well, here I like to call this a vital sign because God is trying to he John is saying you can know if you know him. This is very important. Do you know him? OK, so what does he say? And by this, we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments. Now, 
One of the things um, when I think about knowing, I, I did a little survey. I, at least I took a little walk on the Internet and I did a I looked up a poll to see what it said about people knowing God. And I was stimulated by this because of our the book that we have. Uh, are you a Christian? Are you a church member? Um, and I hope you've read it or are reading it um, because there's a, a part in there that talks about millennials who are falling by the wayside. Many of them don't believe in God. And, and with this poll, it said that, and, and this is the way it, it, it phrased it, a new Harris poll, this came out December 17th of 2013, uh, finds that a strong majority, 74% of the United States adults say they believe in God, but that's down from 82% who expressed such a belief in your earlier years. So, yes, 74% say they believe in God. What God? Okay. 72% um, believe in miracles. That's down from 79% in 2005. 68% believe in heaven, down from 75%. 68% believe that Jesus is God. Whoa, that's a good one. Uh, or the Son of God, down from 72%. 65% believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, down from 70%. Now, what does that mean to us? Because also in that book, it talked about how people leave the church. Okay, and... That's why I believe God still has us here. We have a job to do. Um, but for those of us who are here, I ask the question, how do you know if you really know God? We live in a day when many people are not even interested in knowing God. They could care less about knowing God. They want to live like they want. And get all the possessions and enjoy all the pleasures that the world can give. Um, to know God is the furthest thing from their minds, but this is dangerous ground. And why? Because we see a lot of people leaving here. A lot of people are leaving and they don't want to leave. I mean, you don't even know when it's going to happen. You, you know, things happen on the military base. You think that'd be a safe place. But in a matter of moments, you're gone. Things happen in schools. Who ever thought about schools? But in a matter of moments, your children are gone. We live in a dangerous time. They are going to miss out. That is. Those people who don't know the Lord are going to miss out on the purpose, meaning and significance of life. Uh, they are going to miss out on real love, joy, peace and the abundance of rich of a rich and full life. OK, just knowing your family, just, you know, family is important. Um, but we have problems in our families, too. Um, if, if God exists, then it means that all those who reject him must face his holiness and justice. And we just read about hell in the, fam in the reading that we did. Uh, 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 what God said hell was like. Nobody wants to go there. He says better to cut off your hands or cut off your eyes or everything like that than even go there. Okay, so what's the point? We must know God. How can we tell if we really know him? And these are some of the things that we want to look at. One of the tests it says, do we obey his commandments? The professing man may say, and let's look at verse four. He says, he that said, I know him and keep it not his commandments is a liar. John doesn't miss words. He just calls it like it is. Amen. You're a liar. You say you. Love him and you don't keep his commandments and the truth is not in you. Amen. Talk is cheap. Let me see you walk. 
The professing man um, does not obey his commandments. Let's look at verse five. He says, but whoever keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Now, that's what I call a vital sign. You know that if you're in him, if you're keeping his commandments, then you are a true believer. Based on the word. Okay. One of the things about God is that We can never know whether he exists or not. Bear with me a moment. Have you ever seen him? We've never seen God. We, we don't know what he looks like because he's spirit. We haven't seen spirit. We haven't seen him. But thank God that he wanted us to know him. And how did he do that? He sent his son. He sent his son. He sent his representative. In the flesh. Like us. He's spirit, but he became, he came in the physical, in a physical world, so we could know him. We could, as John said, we could see him. We could hear him. We could touch him. Handle him. Yes. And we can hear what he had to say. Amen. Because he brought the message that God wanted him to bring. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He brought the message that God wanted him to bring. Yes. And the message is to let everybody know that you can have eternal life. Yes. You can have eternal life. Who wouldn't want that? And yet, people reject it. They say, there's no God. Like the guy, young man I met right out here in the front. There's no God. God. He just kept walking. I tried to get him to come back, but no, he just kept walking. Have mercy. Have mercy. Uh, but but that's that's one of the things we see now. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, uh, the son of man. That's John chapter three, verse 13. John chapter three, verse 33 and 38 says, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. For I have come down from heaven not to do mine my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Amen. He came in obedience, in humility. Look who he is. He's God. But he didn't come to do his own will. He came to do the will of his father. John chapter 6, verse 50. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. John 8, 42. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. Amen. This is a group that didn't believe who he was. For I came from God and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. God sent him. And in John chapter 17, five, uh, the great intercessory chapter. It says, Father. Glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Shows that he was with the father. Now, Jesus came to save man from perishing and to give man a full and abundant life, both now and 
eternally. How do we know that? John 3.16. You don't have to look that one up. You know that one. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. To whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. In John 3.36, you may know that one too. I have to look at it, just remember. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So what is the point here? He talks about keeping his commandments. This is very important. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. What are God's commands? In uh, for, turn with me to First John chapter one. I mean, First John chapter three, verse twenty-three. Want to see what his command is? That's easy enough. He says, "If we keep his commandments, we all say, yeah, we keep your commandments." Well, let's see. John chapter First John. Chapter 2, verse 23. Excuse me, verse chapter 3, verse 23. And it says, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandments. Now he tells us, one his commandment is that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we say we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then he says we are to love one another. And the point here is that Some people seek to know God and some people speculate about God. In other words, we may say we know God, but we don't really know God. Why? Because we don't read his book. Or we may have our own ideas about who God is. And we say, OK, well, I do good. So I know God. But. What does the word say? Word says you must know his son. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Uh, some people, uh, they imagine what God is like and hold that image in their mind and try to live by what they imagine. They have their own teachings and their own images of what God is like. And they govern their lives by that image. Some try to seek and to know God by mystical or emotional experiences. You may know some people like that. They seek to know the spiritual world and it's focused through spiritualists, astrology, seances, magic, and a host of other man-made mystical experiences. The man, so the one is do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And two, do we keep his commandments? That is to love one another. We, John gets into that a little bit further later. Uh, the second, I want you to, let's, uh, verse four. Let's see, going back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, He that says, I know him and keep his not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. It is absolutely impossible to know God and to not obey his commands. Why? If God really exists, then he created us. We came from God. He created us for some purpose. He put us on earth for some reason. Therefore, he is bound to tell us why he created us. And God has. Amen. He has. Uh, Jesus Christ has shown us that God is love. God is love. 
that God loves us so much that he has given us the Holy Scriptures to tell us what to do. But more than this, God has shown us uh, his love by giving his son to live the truth outright before our eyes. We saw that. Matter of fact, when they, as he lived his life, they could find no sin, which is why he could die in our place for our sins. Um, this centurly, centurion said, truly, this was the son of God. Um, and they could find no sin. God has not only given us his written word that tells us how to live. He is giving us the living word in the life of his son. So what's the point? If a person says that he knows God and does not keep uh, his commands, he's a liar. The only way a person can know God is to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. To walk in fellowship with God, just like Jesus did. So this person who says, I know him, but does not keep his commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. This person makes a pro false profession. His knowledge of God, what he thinks God is like, is false. His image of God and the ideas within his mind of God are not true. The person who does not know God at all, how can we, uh, how can we tell that a person does not know God? Because he does not obey the commandments of God. There's um, there's some other verses uh, I, I, I'm mindful of um, Matthew chapter seven, verse 21, where the Lord Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. But only those who do the will of my father who is in heaven. <laughs> Matthew chapter seven, verse 21. John 13, 35. He, he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. <laughs> As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That was Mark, Mark 6, 7, chapter 7, verse 6. Uh, in John 13, 35. But this... By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Okay? So, how do people know we are his disciples? You were preaching on it not too long ago. We love one another. <laughs> and I don't know what picture they're getting, but, but we have to show love one for another. You know, and, and there are some hard things John tells us. <laughs> Obedience. Uh, uh, verse 5, uh, going back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. But whosoever keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Uh, this is the, uh, the person who's obedient to God. Um, and knows God and loves God. Note how obedience is tied to knowing and loving God. All these things are involved in knowing anyone. Uh, the only way to get to know someone is to get near them. To study them. To learn about them. All about their will. Their desires. Their wants. Their nature and their thoughts and their behavior. The same is true with God. The only way to know God is to get near him and study him. Learning all we can about him, his will, his desires, his wants, his nature, his thoughts, his behavior. And we do that through his word. Amen. Amen. Uh, but how can we do this when God is in the spiritual world? And we do it because his son came down to teach us. The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came to earth to reveal God to us and to show us what he was like. The, um, I want to take a look at verse 6. 
He says, he that said he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. This is the man who's responsible man who's not only has a talk but a walk. You know, some guys like to talk trash when they playing ball, but they can't play. They don't have a game. <laughs> and you find it out. You're on the court waiting for next. You don't choose that guy. You get somebody else. Um, but that's been a long time ago since I played ball. So there, there's the responsible man, the man who lives up to his profession. Uh, the word walk that uh, we looked at is a con- means a continuous action. It means to keep on walking, to continuously walk. If a person says that he abides in Christ, he must be a responsible person. He must um, he must walk as Jesus walked. And uh, what does that look like? What does it mean to walk as Jesus walked? Uh, well, one of the things it means to believe and trust God. He, that's what he tells us to do, to trust him. And, and he tells us to worship and pray, uh, to fellowship and commune with him, to give and to sacrifice. Uh, and he, he, he gave and sacrificed all that he had to God. It means to seek and to follow after him. Uh, It means teaching and telling others about him. And that's something we can do. I I, I love how pastor greeted me this morning uh, when he came up. uh, I asked him, how was he doing? And that shouldn't have been my first question, but I did. And he told me, God is good. You know what that does? I try to do the same thing when people come up to me to have some word to say about God. Something to say about him. Just to stimulate the conversation, to let God be known, because some people, you know, he's not in their mind. And it's a way of witnessing. So I would encourage you likewise. Um, Loving and caring for others just as Jesus, just as he did. That's what God is teaching us. That's an example. Uh, Obeying all of his commands. That's another example. One of the things that I uh, liked about uh, the service yesterday um, is the scripture that uh, I was asked to read, Psalm 128. And that's why I repeated it, because when I as I was reading, I was thinking about this. The message. It says. And this was about pop. This is why I thought it was so relevant. It says, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. Um, He loved the Lord, and this is Old Testament, so it doesn't talk about Jesus, but we know that he loved the Lord Jesus. And he did his best to walk, to follow Christ. And that's what, that was Old Testament. So... um, now, I want to give you a second test, and I know I didn't look at the clock, Brother George, so you have to let me Amen. know how much time I got. <laughs> you heard him. <laughs> um, chapter 2, uh, uh, 1 John chapter 2, I want to take a look at verse 7. So we know one of the vital signs is to keep his commandments. Love the Lord Jesus, keep his commandments. Verse seven, it says, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that said he is in the light and hateth his brothers in darkness, even unto now. He that loveth his brother abide in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not where he goeth, because darkness hath blinded his eyes. And this is the last one I'm going to do, uh, so you can take comfort in that. Um, 
How do we know that we really know God? Do we love our neighbor? If we criticize, grumble, gripe, backbite, ignore, neglect, curse, abuse, slander, hate, or mistreat our neighbor in any way, then we do not know God. Now that stepped on my feet. I, I imagine may have stepped on yours too. No matter what we may claim, nor how loudly we may claim it, we do not know God if we do not love our neighbor. God is love. Therefore, any person who truly knows God is bound to love. Loving others is a strong test of our knowledge of God. We can tell whether or not we know God by testing our love for others. The, um, he gave us the test in verses 7 and 8. Uh, the man, let's look at verse 9. I just want to go there a moment. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even unto now. This is the man who professes God but hates his brother. Um, do we follow after the supreme command, the command to love our neighbor? I want to give you three significant facts. This is not a new command. Um, he says that in verse 7. He says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which, we, which ye have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. It says, This is not a new command, but an old command. Observe, John does not come right out and say, that he was talking about love, not immediately. He says that the command he is talking about is not a new command, but an old command. Is the command that they had heard from the beginning. Amen. Now, this was, I found, enlightening when I read, and I just want to share it with you, so wake up if I put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> because you're about to miss something. One of the very things that God ever said to man was this, that man must love his neighbor. I want you to turn with me to Leviticus chapter 19, 18. Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. says, Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Why then would John not go ahead and mention the command? Why take a backdoor approach to the subject of love? John had a very good reason. What John is about to say is new. So new that people would say that it is that it was his own idea and not the truth. Therefore, John had to establish the fact that God has said the same thing from the beginning of time. He was about to say something new, okay? But it wasn't new, it was from the okay? Now, but note a cr crucial question. If the command of love has been with man from the beginning of time, how can it be a new command? What is there about the command that might upset people and cause them to turn away from John's exhortation? And so we see the answer is, take a look at verse 8. Let's go back to 1 John. If if. Like me, I lost my spot. Verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Amen. Okay? Again, what's new about love? Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Amen. Jesus Christ is new. That's what he's making. Jesus Christ gave love a new meaning. Think about this. Jesus not only said, love our neighbors, but he said, love not only your friends, but your enemies. That was new. He says, love not only good people, but bad people. He says, love not only the righteous, but the sinner. He says, love not only the acceptable, but the rejected. He says, love not only the clean, but the dirty. Jesus himself stated the fact, as clear as it can be stated, he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and 45. He said, you have heard that it has been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for the pray for those who persecute you. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. He caused his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Wow. He raised the bar. Now, it was it was probably there all along. In the Old Testament. But when he explains it now. The bar is raised for us. Okay. Love our enemies. Who doesn't have an enemy? Well. There's some people only a mother could love. But we we have. We have people. Who can get on your last nerve. So the Lord is working. On my nerves. Let me put it that way. This was a totally new concept for love. Man has always felt free to mistreat others, especially those who have mistreated him. And you think about it. You know, I I saw the movie recently, uh, the slave movie. Yeah, 12 Years a Slave. I've seen them before, but not that there was anything new. But just to think about how people were treated. But it's not new. It's been going on for, for since man's been here. Uh, it's not just the white man. It's been the, you know, you look over in Africa. Absolutely. It's everywhere. But that's just one. That's just one example. OK. But you talk about. Um. This was a totally new concept about man has always felt free to treat uh, others uh, or mistreat others, especially those who had mistreated him. He felt free to hate. And you think about this. I, 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 I was looking at um, I was looking at a, a picture and it talked about the tree in the garden. OK, but not only was it a fruit. That was forbidden. He told him not to eat it. And I'm not sure that there was anything wrong with the fruit, but it's just that the fact that God said. Okay, that was enough. God said. But think about what happened in that fruit. There was hate in that. fruit. Well, not in the fruit necessarily, but hate. There was hurt. There was lust. All the things that we hate murder. Stealing, all those things came as a result of the fruit. Um, And and what we want to do is strike back, hurt people, ignore people, neglect people, criticize people, be unkind to people, backbite and retaliate. All of those things. When God says we are to love our neighbors. So when he says. Do you really do you know if you really know God? All I'm saying, maybe you don't have to question yourself. I had to question myself. I tell you, because it means I got to pray, brother. It do. Um, But Jesus Christ has shown that we cannot mistreat people no matter what they have done, that we must love everyone no matter who they are. Um, 
and, and note his words that you may be sons of the father in heaven. Matthew 545. The only way we can become children of God is to love even as God loves. If we do not love, then we do not know God for God is love. He is the he is the love that loves all people, no matter who they are. Jesus Christ said uh, this astounding thing. The only way people can tell that we are his disciples is by our love for one another. Our discipleship and our knowledge of God can be measured by whether or not we love our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, I, I know even in families we love one another. But there can be disagreement in families. You can have problems in families. And I'm dealing with one. And uh, we're praying about it. But, but um, you know, I notice oftentimes when people come looking for help, we ask them, well, you know, have you asked your family? Well, I don't have no family. Well, you know, I know everybody got some family. You didn't come here by yourself. Um, but it just tells me that there's a problem that needs to be ironed out. And, you know, it happens in the church, too. Um, we can somebody can say something to somebody and it rubs us the wrong way. And before you know it, we want to go out the door and not come back. And one of the things is, and that's one of the things I like about the book, is that we have to develop a little thicker skin, for one, because there's always some tribulation. I mean, we don't agree with everything. Uh, everybody doesn't agree with it. God didn't make us that way. You know, I, I went back and I lo started looking from Genesis on. And every character that I saw had some type of conflict. Uh, whether it be Abraham with, with, with Sarah or Abraham with Hagar or um, Joseph with his father putting his hands on the knee. Son, put your hand here, put your hand here. No, he switches them up. No, no, put, put them here. You know, <laughs> that was a problem. <laughs> you know, when he wanted to bless his son. So, there are always problems. Amen. But the Lord tells us, you know, he knew that. He knew that. That's why he told us that if you, if you offend your brother, go to your brother. Okay? That's what we're supposed to do. But what do we do? No, we don't go to our brother. We don't. Yeah, we'll go everybody else. We'll tell the story all over. But we won't go to our brother. And that's what he's trying to teach us. Amen. Keep my commandments. Do what I say. You know, and when you do that, we all learn something from it. We grow. We grow. That's what happens. And then we can be real brothers and sisters. You know, you can learn to trust your brother, trust your sister. But we got some growing to do. Uh, he knows that, but that's why we keep having our problems sometimes. We, you know, you didn't get it right this time. We got to try this again. Um, I'm almost there. Uh, just a few things. See, I want to go back to verse 9. He that said he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even unto now. But the person... Uh, hates his brother, he says, oh, I don't hate my brother. I just don't like him. <laughs> I don't know how to get along with him. Or he just turns me off. His appearance, his behavior, or he did me wrong. He mistreated me. Whatever the reason, it is not love. Amen. Love is love. It is not mistreatment or hate. And Jesus Christ revealed the light of love to us. We must love our neighbors, even those who are our enemies. If we are to become children of God and followers of him, no man walks in the light of God. 
No man knows God unless he loves his neighbor. Even the neighbors who stand against him. If we hate our neighbors, neglect, dislike, disregard, criticize, bite, bite, and mistreat them, we are not living in the light nor living in Christ. We are making false profession. We do not know God. Not really. No matter what we claim. We are living in the darkness of this world, living like most people in the world live, hating some of our brothers. Verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. This is the obedient man, the man who loves his brother. Two wonderful things are said about the person who loves his brother. He is a man who lives in the light, that is, in Christ, and the obedient man who lives and walks in Christ. Uh, he walks in the love just as Jesus Christ walked in love. What does it mean to walk in love? Scripture tell, spells out some of the very practical acts. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or is not jealous. Love does not boast, is not proud, is not ignorant or, or prideful. You know these. These are the fruits of the spirit. Love is not rude or becoming indecent or, or unmannerly. Love is not self-seeking her own, is not selfish, insisting on one's right and ways. We see that all the time. I mean, you ever been cut off? Um no, don't go there. <laughs> but it's a test. It tests our love. It tests our, our walk. Okay? It happens to us all. Love is not easily angered. It's not touchy, fretty, resentful. Love keeps no record of wrongs, harbors no evil thoughts, takes no account of wrongdoing or done to it. Loves do not delight in evil. In, in wrong, sin, evil, injustice, but rejoices in the truth, in justice, in righteousness. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Exercises faith in everything under all circumstances. Love always perseveres, never weakens, has the power to endure. That's what we have to be to do what God has us to do. It's easy to stand when things are going good. That ain't where we are. Things are not may not be going so good. We have to stand. He's faithful. Uh, the man who loves his brother has nothing in him to make him stumble. There is nothing in him to make him stumble, nothing to trip him up in life, nothing to make him fall and hurt himself. Or destroy his life. How can this be? He can be. How can it be said of any man. That he will not stumble. Because love. Is the great binding force. Of the universe. God is love. Therefore the more we love God. The closer and closer we draw to him. There's a scripture that says. Draw near to God and he will draw near to us. Um, And the closer we get to him the more we learn to trust his care, his provision, his protection, and power. When God is taking care of us, there is absolutely nothing that can touch us. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 39. You're familiar with that. The great need of man is love. Man needs to be loved. But not with the sentimental feelings and passions of the world, that come and go as freely as the falling star that shoots across the sky. Man needs to be loved with the love of God. The kind of love just just covered above that we just talked about. The kind of love that will help him to know that God loves him. Man needs to know that God cares for him and wants to deliver and strengthen him against all the trials of life. And pastor said it this morning. Trials help us know God. Help us come to God. Um, This kind of love will pull men together. Not alienate them. The man who loves his neighbor like this will not fail to live the kind of life he should live. 
Now, there's a bunch of scripture, but I just want to deal with darkness and then in, in closing. Um, when it talked about in verse 11, it says, But he that hateth his brothers in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not where he goes, because darkness hath blinded his eyes. Amen. With uh, darkness and hate, there is uh, the bitter hating man. That's the, that's the person... Uh, this person differs from the person that we just talked about before uh, because he does not profess to know God. He is a man who is totally lost in, his, in the darkness of this world. And several things are said about this man. He is in darkness and walks in darkness. He is not in the light and not in Christ. Therefore, he does not know God. He does not even profess to know God. When it comes to God and Christ, he is totally in the dark and often could care less. He takes what he can and accumulates all that he can, no matter who it hurts. Amen. He cares little about other people except perhaps family and close friends. And he lives mainly for the pleasures and passions of the world. Therefore, how he treats his neighbor matters little just so he gets what he wants. He has no direction and is blind. He does not look beyond his life and he is blind to it. He sees little, if any, meaning to life other than getting all he can of his comfort, pleasure, and possessions. Therefore, to hate his neighbor means nothing to him if his neighbor gets in his way. And that's sort of what we see today. Note, when a man hates or is bitter against another person, it blinds him even more. He often focuses upon getting back at the person who loses and loses sight of what he should be doing. He just cannot see the truth. I don't know about you, but I remember, boy, my mom or dad used to put a licking on my, you know, rear, just like your pop. And boy, I'd be crying so much, I couldn't see what was in front of me. <laughs> so you talking about being blind, understand, you can't see. Um, here's a thought. How often a person has opposed a good project simply because he was upset with the leader? The great good of the project is often clearly visible. But hatred blinds the mind and more tragically, the heart. So much so that a person makes a fool out of himself without even knowing it. But more tragically, he often causes damage and division among people. And his soul is doomed to be in darkness forever. Forever separated from the light of God and of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that... Uh, as we've gone through this exercise that it has perhaps enlightened you about what the word says about how do we know if we really know God.